You're listening to Control Talk Now, the Smart Buildings Podcast. With the man, the myth, the legend, the legend. Ken Smyers and Eric Stromquist. Control Talk Now, the weekly podcast with building automation and smart building control news you can use. Now, here's Eric. Hi, welcome to Control Talk Now, your smart buildings video cast and podcast for the week ending February 7th, 2016. My name is Eric Stromquist, and I am joined, as usual, by the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, Kenny Smyers from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Kenny, welcome to the show, Big Dog. Thanks, Eric. It's, a, it's great to be here, as always, and I really enjoy the introduction. And we have an amazingly uh, entertaining, important, relevant show for today. Right, so Kenny's, really got, Kenny's got the Super Bowl fix. He knows who's going to win, as you guys know. Super Bowl <laughs> Sunday, so later on tonight, uh, uh, if, you, if you dial Kenny's number, one 777 and it's only $10, Kenny will give you the Super Bowl fix. Not true, guys. Not true at all. In fact, you know what? Uh, I had an interesting conversation, and I'm split. I really like uh, Manning. Uh, if this is last year, he's never won a Super Bowl. I'd really like to see him get it. But I don't think anybody's going to beat Carolina Panthers. I think Cam Newton's probably the single. He's the, he's the MVP this year. He's just really put it all together. He's very entertaining, and he's talented, and they got a heck of a defense. We, we just have some incredible stuff, and I, we should get right into it because uh, we, we've got two really, really precious, important interviews as far as knowledge of our industry, what's, what's to come. And uh, we can well, get started. Well, let's get started with our first interview. Tell us about our first guest. Well, the first guests are the uh, the two from Echo Rhythm. We have uh, John Morris, who's the Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and we have Dr. Igor Mezik, who's probably one of the brightest guys we've ever had the pleasure of interviewing and, and giving us you know a, a layman's term of the scientist view of, of building management, of, of the physics involved. And it's just an incredible interview. Well, no, it is incredible. So we got these guys on ready, ready to tee it up, ready to go. Okay, but let's sort of put it in context because Ken Sinclair turned us on to these guys and they are actually using artificial intelligence. And, and, and I think if you take that to its logical conclusion, you could have a building that runs itself without the aid of anybody else. So uh, with that, Kenny, I can't wait to talk to our next guest. So let's bring them on. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Greetings from beautiful Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, guys, tell us a bit about what you, Echo Rhythm does and what you guys are all about, please. So essentially what we've done is uh, using Igor's uh, software algorithms that were developed uh, at the UC Santa Barbara, uh, we've created what we call the True Analytics Software Platform, uh, which essentially can analyze anything in the Internet of Things where we've got... Uh, appropriate data available. Uh, We're currently focusing on the building HVAC market, um, but we are, we'll move beyond that once we we skin this market, we have a chance to move on to other things. Um, It's a pure SaaS model. Uh, It's very highly accurate. Uh, We've had a a major IT company take a look at at, uh, the findings we've done in in one of their buildings, and uh, there's nothing like this in the market anywhere in the world. Well, John, let me uh, – I, I do want to get a little bit more on Igor. Uh, Igor, you're a professor of mechanical engineering and mathematics at UC Santa Barbara. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background so we can get kind of immersed in how you, you came up with this uh, amazing algorithm? Um, sure. I'm a mechanical engineer, engineer by training. Um, I, I did my undergrad in uh, Croatia at the Northwest uh, side. Um, and I watched a number of people that are close to me, like my dad, who's the you know, captain of – uh, massive French cargo ships, and then my uh, father-in-law, who, who started an HVAC uh, company, and he designed HVAC uh, systems for resorts and, and hotels. I I helped him in that, and I I sailed with my dad, and I just watched these people, you know, do what they do, uh, dealing with also an immense amount of data, but then making very good decisions out of those, and and I thought. As I was going on with um, my work, my professional work, uh, wouldn't it be nice to develop pr- platforms that can help people like that, you know, make those decisions even faster but equally accurate? And so, uh, I, I, when I first uh, came to the United States, my uh, grad graduate work was at um, Caltech in mechanical engineering, and then uh, I, I got interested in algorithmic aspects of engineering. 
And so I decided to do my um, uh, postdoctoral research in mathematics. And I went back to uh, the United Kingdom, uh, to University of Warwick. And then I uh, had a number of offers from the U.S. for professorships. I joined um, uh, the faculty at UC Santa Barbara. And what was interesting and, and really great is UC Santa Barbara has a great sustainability record. It, it has a great group of people that care about environment and energy, and we started an institute for energy efficiency. Awesome. It worked out really nicely. Last year we got Shuji Nakamura, my colleague, got the Nobel Prize in uh, LEDs, if you, you've probably heard about that one. All right, John, you've been around the industry, uh, the building and controls industry, for a couple of decades now. got great experience. Uh, what makes an ecorhythm a game changer in your view? Well, I've been in this space for about 20 years, uh, going back to uh, the very first networking platform, which was the Lawnworks platform with, uh, with Echelon. It was effectively a prototype of the Internet of Things. It was not IP, obviously. But uh, once the devices became networked, big data became a real possibility. Um, when I first saw Ecorhythm's technology, it was very clear that they were in uncharted waters making sense of the, the data that building systems were capable of delivering. What are, what are the big problems that, uh, that, you could, that you guys are solving, and how does that sort of translate to customers, if you will? So um, from a technical standpoint, it, there are two essential things here. And one is scalability. You really want to be able to scale quickly to a large number of buildings. And the other one is the specificity. And these two things kind of go head to head sometimes because if you want scalability, you're talking about you know smaller, maybe smaller number of points. You're talking specificity, or you're talking about large number of points. So um, you know the analysis of buildings is relatively tough. Recommissioning takes months and months of study. What we developed is a platform technically that can, at the same time, take a very very large number of points, but it's quite scalable and it gives very specific knowledge um, to the building engineer um, that they can utilize and go and, 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 and apply and correct whatever, whatever um, the machine learning algorithms uh, came up with. Awesome. You know, John, you mentioned uh, a couple of things here too that I wanted to uh, catch on to uh, or bring to bear. Uh, you branded this software, Echorhythm Software Platform, True analytics, uh, meaning that this is really the what analytics are all about. And some of the other people saying about analytics are really not essentially analytics. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. So, so in in a real analytics platform, what you're doing is you're you're taking in the data and then you're you're coming up with conclusions that are not necessarily just a sensors out of range. We're looking for what Igor describes as unhealthy behavior based on, on departures from the normal ebb and flow of energy in the building. You, you, I'm, I'm going to throw it to you and let you finish this one off. So um, there is the ability to go very, very deep and um, understand or mach the machine itself is able to understand what the root cause of a problem is based on a pattern recognition that it does on the various cycles that are occurring in the building. I mean, to, to just uh, describe this very, very briefly, let's say over 24 hours, uh, it, you know, a very, very simple problem, over 24 hours you have a variety of cycles, things come on, things come off. Some of them are very healthy. If things get shut down at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, that's, that's a healthy part of the 24-hour cycle. But if you have stuff cycling at 30 minutes on top of that 24-hour um, cycle, then that might be unhealthy. And so we actually take that information and uh, put it into a sort of work ticket. So saying this particular piece of equipment is doing that, and this is the root cause, and you know it might it might even fatigue and fail because of this. So it's pretty comp comprehensive, pretty specific. Maybe you want to say how it translates to customers. Sure. I mean, uh, so when we engage a customer, uh, the, the discussion always seems to start out with. How can you save me energy? Um, because the the uh, brokers and folks are looking for buildings that are above an energy star score or a lead score above X. Um, and that's a great place to start. Um, once we get in the building, we're a pure SaaS model. So uh, we generate a, a great ROI just on the energy alone. But 
Because of our comfort console and the way we are able to demonstrate how a building is performing as a, as a quality asset where tenants, you can show them you are comfortable in your space and you can show future tenants that are being brought in by a broker that your building is demonstrably comfortable. That's the second layer of the onion. The third layer is when the engineering staff stops chasing shadows around the building and really gets to root causes, as Igor just explained, you get a much, much more efficient engineering operation in the building, which then adds the ROI. So it's, it's three layers of things. And if you think about you know, the, the actual energy piece of this deal, it's a small slice of a very large rent roll. Yeah, it seems like, you know, the operational cost is a huge piece. But if I'm understanding you guys correctly, because, you know, there are a lot of, you know, really nice analytics packages in our industry already. It sounds like what you guys do, maybe that's a little bit different, is not only do you do the analytics, but it seems like you guys have modules to do the diagnostics, too. So instead of relying on somebody to interpret that data, you guys, um, your algorithms would interpret it and identify, like Igor, you said, root causes and things like that. Yeah, and, and this is semantics. It's, it's great to point out that difference, right? Diagnostics versus analytics. We call it true analytics because it, it goes deeper than the usual, let's make a correlation between the outside temperature and you know the amount of energy that the building should be using. Uh, We're going to go specific to a VAV or to an air handling unit um, and diagnose what is wrong with that uh, type of unit, and then that leads to predictive maintenance aspects of it, it leads to ability to improve the comfort, and it kind of pays for itself by the fact that it actually has substantial energy savings. Oh, absolutely. Hey, associated. Yeah, absolutely, fellas. And I think the thing, you know, some of these packages, and it sounds like you guys probably already do this, if not, it would be very easy to do. But as you guys know, when you get a building, somebody comes in and tweaks everything, they commission it, and probably 10 minutes after that, they've got it set up working perfectly, it, it comes out of commission. So one of the trends that Kenny and I have been tracking and, and it seems like companies like yours are really leading that way is what we call a buzzword is constant recommissioning or uh, automatic recommissioning. So you, for example, are looking at a PID loop, a proportional integral derivative loop, and all of a sudden that, that valve or that air handler now is, is not controlling as, it, w- the way it was before. So you, maybe you send a signal to it and it re-auto-tunes itself and comes back in. So there's a constant recommissioning of the building, if you will. Is that something that's built into your guys' uh, package already? Um, absolutely. I think we're talking about the real-time aspect, and I'll comment, yes. on that. I'll comment on that in a second. But the first part that I want to comment on is the idea of constant commissioning in the community, energy and buildings community, has been around for a while. I think what Ecoritum solves specifically in that context is the scalability of the idea. Nice. Because, because a great engineer can, of course, do constant commissioning, or a great group of engineers. You can have you know, 100 engineers or 200 or 1,000 engineers working on a problem. They're going to do a great job. There is no doubt about it. The, the issue here is to uh, help or even do completely automatically in real time uh, that particular job. So to take the domain knowledge, make it into a, a, a machine, you know, artificial intelligence platform that really does something. Now, we don't do real time as of now. And the reason for that is that, of course, we also trust the building engineers to pursue their judgment as well. I mean, there is this notion of building whisperer that we talked about in, in an article uh, a couple of months ago. So when we talk to them, they require us to give them the information and we trust them to do with the information whatever they need to do with the information at this point in time. There is no technical restriction on the platform to be able to do the writing that you've just alluded to. And I, I think ultimately that's where we are going to when companies like ours, a, you know, got enough uh, 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 fall detection and, and uh, artificial intelligence capability to basically just run the building on its own. I think that's a beautiful, I think that's a beautiful future that that enables building engineers to work even more productively. That's what I think. Yeah, and, and the other thing that gets addressed by this, of course, is is if you're following the conferences and things, one of the alarm bells that is constantly being sounded these days is that the building whisperer as a as a profession, those people are retiring. 
And good point. People coming behind them are are somewhat less skilled. They move around. They don't get. They don't stay in the same building for twenty or thirty years. This platform makes a junior engineer much, much more efficient and can actually approach what the building whisperer could have done uh, if they were still in the building after those guys uh, head off into the sunset. <laughs> you know, I, I, John I, and, and Igor, I, I, this is fabulous stuff because uh, we're very much interested in it. And we think we're there. We think the technology is there. But are there limitations to just how uh, intelligent a building can be? And, and you mentioned data ready buildings. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, are, is every building has the potential to be a, a a, a source of great savings and how do you get to it and, and, and how do you make this more of a commercial uh, approach where you can where people like us can sell it? So basically any BMS system is generating data. Sensors are measuring things, actuators are moving, positions are available. Uh, the trick is to, to be able to get the data out of the building and you know, we've been able to pretty successfully figure that out. Um, it's taken some time, and, and there, are, there are companies that are being tasked by their investors to actually go solve that problem. I just came from HR Expo uh, last week, and we identified three or four platforms that are aimed specifically at conditioning buildings that aren't necessarily data-ready uh, at the level that we like. I mean, we would, we'd like a five-minute trend if that's capable in the system. Um, we found these appliances that can artfully uh, work within the technical constraints of these older buildings uh, to be able to get the data out. And uh, uh, that expands our market share dramatically as we're able to, to move farther and farther back in, the, in the, the, uh, the history of building controls to be able to make more and more of them data ready. But that's well, one John, of the as a correlated question, I mean, so when you were talking about layers and stuff, so how, and, and data ready points, so basically you're working right off the infrastructure that's already in place, whether it's a DDC system or a building automation system, you're agnostic, it can take anybody's information and apply your technologies to anybody's stuff. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's a, it, that's the value of a pure physics approach. And, and you know, Igor can speak to that directly. So... We, we certainly need data, but as you said, we are agnostic, we are agnostic to where the data comes from. Uh, to just give you an example, we take like between 1,000 and 15,000 data points on 5 to 15 minute intervals, and we need to get the data from somewhere. As John alluded to earlier, we can ramp up a building, if it's data ready, in hours to, to a day. So it, it's very, very quick. I think that trend is going to continue. More and more buildings are going to be becoming data ready. We initially focused on large commercial buildings because that, that actually makes sense for, for a number of different reasons. Uh, uh, they spend the most energy and, uh, and they're most data, data ready. Yeah, and, and to, to jump off of that a little bit, one of the differentiators, and, and Igor just swerved into it with, with our platform, is that we can bring up a building in in hours to, to a day or two, as opposed to the rules-based system that requires you to go in and actually know about the sequence of operations and the, the, all the, the different things that are going on in the BMS system. We hear stories of uh, installations taking weeks to months. Um, I'm aware of one platform that the entry price is somewhere in the, the six figures. Um, that platform is now out of the market. Um, we're able to do this with Essentially, no upfront cost uh, to the uh, to the building owners, uh, except just getting the, the data out of the building. Um, so we can execute a pure SaaS model that uh, other platforms just simply can't do. So listen, I'm I'm thinking I'm fascinated by this, and I'm thinking about it, guys. So I'm I'm wondering, is there an add-on module that will look at the stock market? So while I'm tweaking my while it's tweaking my building and give me information on my building. It's also tell me which trades I need to be in and out of. Uh, that, that's a that's a great question. Uh, you know, any company that is trying to do uh, things that are new and within the analytics context needs to understand what uh, their domain knowledge at, at a particular point in time is. And Ecoritum is certainly looking at the more general Internet of Things 
uh, setup. Things like wind turbines, automotive, other things. Stock market, uh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, next. Maybe. It's, it's on the drawing board. <laughs> well, no, but 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 but, but you, sort, you sort of bring up a good point, and, and, and I'm fascinated by this, too, because, you know, when Ken Sinclair turned us on to you guys, he was talking about you guys were using artificial intelligence, which to me applies that, that it's sort of the, or the algorithm sort of self-learning in a way, which, you know, obviously, you know, there's one level, layer of it where they, they take the data and they make certain assumptions. But over time, do your algorithms get smarter? Yeah, so that, that's actually an interesting point. So... We, and that comes from the research we've done, we've done earlier, we actually tune these things so that they have a time dimension. There is one big difference between the algorithms that are used here and the algorithms that typically get used. You typically get correlation-based algorithms that say, like I said before, you know, if this is out of range, then go and look at some other thing. Uh, here we are actually taking a look at the time dimension. Uh, so how do things change over time? And even the companies that do artificial intelligence today, there are very few, I frankly don't know of any right now, that are doing the time dimension the way uh, Ecoritum pursues it, coming from some earlier, you know, DARPA-based research uh, that, that, that we've done. So the time dimension is very, very important to this technology and to those algorithms and the uh, software learns as it goes. Well, speak about that because I mean, you really tweak something when you when you start thinking about time. I mean, I can think of you know things like when you change your filters and all, or obviously time based events as well as usage based events. But speak more about how you guys because I, I definitely get that it's important. But could you speak more about where you guys see that? Uh, you know, how would that show up in somebody's building? I'm a building owner, or Kenny and I are out trying to sell your system, and we go, the stock market module's not quite out yet, but, uh, you know, we're, we're bringing time in on this, and this is going to save you because there's, there's the time dimension that allows the, 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 the algorithm to become more learning, if you will. So if you take a look at, for example, the, the, the typical issue of high-frequency uh, cycling, Yep. Um, on, on the VAV side. That's something that's very, very difficult to, to detect with uh, static-based algorithms. I mean, what do you really detect? You're detecting a cycle. Right. So here's a time dimension that absolutely necessarily needs to be in there. If you're talking about the behavior of the building over a year, you know, and correlating that with energy, yeah, then you're, you're taking a snapshot over a year. We take a five-minute one, right? Yeah. So we see the cycling in the VAVs. To, to just give you an example... On a piece of work that Ecoritum has done, um, uh, there was an issue in which a lot of heat pumps, uh, a very large percentage, 20 to 30 percent of heat pumps, were um, cycling at very high frequency. That leads to fatigue, that leads to um, obviously possibly smoke coming out of those <laughs> uh, compressors at, at some point in time. So. Um, being predictive about it, but taking into account the time dimension, so not just the mean. Because the thing is cycling around the mean, right? If you just take the mean out and you're not paying attention to the fact that it's cycling, you have lost the piece of information that possibly leads to energy waste and 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 um, and a lack of predictive ma maintenance. Well, Igor, the piece I heard that, that that and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like by adding the time dimension and an infinite time dimension as opposed to a finite time dimension, it seems like your predictability is going to go way up in accuracy. With it goes up in accuracy. I, I do have to say, we do have the temporal, so time dimension and spatial dimension as well. We pay attention to system as a whole, mm -hmm. rather than just the time dimension. Right? So it goes up with both the number of points, spatial number of points that are accessed, and the resolution in time. When you combine these things together, and you have a chain, let's say you're detecting the same time signature in your chiller. Let's say the chiller is oscillating at, at a 30 minute time scale and in an e, e, AHU and the VAV. Where is the culprit in that chain? I can tell you, for example, that a system might come up with a statement that says it's a high, high gain controller from the zone to the VAV that's actually causing the whole thing and causing the oscillation. Everything in the back is reacting to that. Or, no, it's the chiller. Actually, we had you know, a situation in which the chiller can spend not at those time scales, but let's say two to three hours, 
these things are highly correlated and you need to take a look at the variety of time scales in the system and what the connections between the, between the different parts of the system are. So we don't look at, at an isolated component like a VAV uh, just by itself, or rather we. The software doesn't look at an isolated component like, like, like a VAV by itself. It actually looks at a whole chain that leads to something in the chain being wrong and then pinpoints that. And so you can see how the spatial and temporal could play a pretty substantial role. Well, it's like the difference between a two-dimension image and a three-dimension image, right? I mean, you're adding another dimension dimension to it that, uh, uh, cool. This is great stuff. What what happens next? In other words, um, it sounds like you guys got a really good start and you really got a very, very interesting, uh, game-changing, technically sound, scientific approach. How does, where does EcoRhythm go from here? How do you, uh, what's the future hold as far as like, where you go, what, how are you going to uh, commercialize this, if, if that's the right word? Well, so, you know, we're starting with, with HVAC and buildings. That's just the beginning. It's the first IoT application that we've applied the technology to. But as, as Igor can tell you, when you move out into smart grids, smart cities, uh, automotive, uh, like any number of different IoT applications where the same kinds of, of physical events are taking place. Any of those things can, this, uh, this set of algorithms can be applied to as long as there's a little domain knowledge that comes along with it. And I'll, I'll throw that back to you, Igor, you can expound. Yeah, we built the software platform to be layered in the sense that it takes the physical data, it recognizes the, the, the patterns, but then it has the layers of abstraction that can handle a large variety of diagnostic goals. So if you give us a wind turbine or, or a car engine, we do have a platform that is a physics agnostic platform, and then we have a part that is physics recognizing. Let's put it, let's split it in those two ways. And do, those two things are modular in the sense that whatever is recognizing the cycles has the domain knowledge in it. A car engine or a, so a wind turbine is actually going to have a 24-hour cycle, but a car engine, not necessarily. It's going to have very, very different patterns in it, right? So that's the part that needs to be domain uh, conscious. The part that is not domain conscious and that is universal and it's organized as a, in software layers is really the part that our software, our great software team has, uh, has, has built in. So that enables the universality. We don't need to go in and really change our software platform in order to tackle a new Internet of Things uh, uh, domain. Well, Eric, uh, I just want to throw this, I've been waiting to say this, uh, Dr. Mezik is also an expert in complex dynamical systems both as a member of the Center for Controls, Dynamic Systems, Computations, California Nano Systems Institute, but his major scientific contribution in the field has been the development of operator theoretic methods for analysis of complex dynamical systems that led to a massive number of applications in the big data dynamics, a term that Dr. Mezek coined. So we're, we're talking with one of the top sharpest talking knives. To the father of big, the, the guy called it big data, huh? So, Kate, we, we welcome that's to awesome. Space uh, to become to, to reduce our carbon footprint. We need to become more energy uh, efficient and, and and save more money in operation technology. And it sounds like you have the dynamic. Uh, you have the future in your hands. And, and when you go public, let us know. <laughs> that would be that would be really nice. But uh, thank you. This this was very pleasant. I should say I only added big data dynamics to it. Dynamics is very important to us, as I mentioned. But thanks for having us. Well, that is definitely the most important D in big data dynamics. The dynamics, anybody can do big data, but big data dynamics is you guys. How do people get a hold of you fellas who want more information? Website? Yeah, www.ecorhythm.com. That's E C O R I T H M.com. Listen, guys, we, 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 we look forward to keep, keep, keeping track on you guys, and, and hopefully you will see a meteoric rise for you guys. And anything we do to help, let us know. We'd love to have you come back on Control Trends, sort of keep us updated from time to time. We'll join you anytime you ask. Thanks, fellas.
Eric, I, I tell you what, it, that's uh, that's that's what's coming in the future, and these guys are going to be a part of that. And it's so and, and incredibly uh, synchronistic that Control Trans got got a hold of this information, and we we learn about it though individually as professionals. This is what's coming. Machine learning analytics are going to become staples in our industry, and it's just going to keep getting better. Uh, imagine when these guys go commercial and get the economy of scale. It's going to be everybody's going to have this. Uh, it's going to improve the analytics. And, well, let me tell you, let me tell you something, Kenny. I'm, I'm getting hold of Igor now. While you were busy doing something else, I got, I got his contact information. I'm going to have him write a little chip I can put in my brain, man, that's going to have me do analytics and be able to keep up with you, big dog. So, uh, hey, that was oh, great wow. stuff, and I'm really glad we it's had a chance to chip. catch up with those guys. And yeah, we'll keep up with them. We'll keep you posted on what they're doing. But in the meantime, be sure to check their website out. All right, Kenny, so we, we had some posts on Control Trends this week. What will we have up first? We sure do, Eric. Uh, well, Ken St. Clair's Automated Buildings February Edition 2016 release, Making It Mashable. Uh, we are going to use that term and make uh, Ken's uh, entry there uh, mashable with the interview we do at the end of the show. But uh, it's a great uh, February edition, has some great editorial comments, and, and we talk in depth about the term mashability. So we'll come back to that and move on to our next Now, post. wait a minute. That, that was something you used to do. The Smyers boys used to do playing high school football, right? I mean, when you guys would play other teams, you and your brother Dave and Tommy and the rest of you guys that played high school football would look at them and go, those guys are mashable, right? Is that That's where that term originated, right? No, actually, mashable comes from an IT world where you have uh, applications that uh, work within each other or work in complement uh, to each other. And it's about uh, the relative aspect of this is that we can't afford as an industry not to have the products and the, and the solutions we sell immediately integratable and open platformable to everything existing. So everybody tries to do it themselves and doesn't get it done or doesn't get it implemented properly or it's a proprietary version. Those, those days are kind of gone. So if you make it mashable, then you are survivable and you're. Well, I can't. I can't wait to. I can't wait to talk to Ken about this later in the show. But uh, Kenny, in your estimation, what percentage of the products that that, that we deal with are, are are in the building automation controls business would you consider mashable today? Well, Eric, I think we've seen a great transition in the last five years. We've seen a transition where uh, many, many solutions are mashable. All the analytics stuff, uh, Sky Foundry, uh, all the data visualization stuff, DG Logic, Haystack uh, in Haystack, right? Project Haystack coming up, yeah. J2 Innovations. In other words, those guys created the mashability. They took, they want information and, and the data to rise up and become, you know, immediately available to other systems and other, you know cloud applications. So, but the, the, the manufacturers, as, as D, we have a post coming up here with Eugene Mazzo, or I'm sorry, we had that uh, last week where he went to the hospital. Uh, he went to that uh, Health 2016 at the uh, University of California, San Francisco. And he said that he's evangelizing open sourcing because it's still not where it should be. And there's still a potential that uh, a large investment made by a hospital or a health uh, provider could could wind up being going down a, a you know one way road where it becomes very difficult and arduous to take the information that would improve uh, healthcare that would improve a uh, doctor um, you know uh, analyzing patient information it, it could be it could retard that process if it isn't open platform and mashable. Well, it's really cool, and I think there are probably degrees of mashability too. Because I mean, there are people that would argue that Apple, for example, is not really mashable because it is a proprietary protocol. They control the whole thing, although they they do open up aspects of it, Kenny, where you can build apps for it. So that's on one end of it, and then the other end would be some like Linux, which is completely open source. So I can't wait. You guys stay tuned. We got Ken Sinclair coming up up here in a bit we'll talk more about mashability but kenny what do we have up next on the show on the post last well, week let's speak of mashability and talking about uh, you know an open platform uh, a framework where you invest in it and you can keep adding to it we had vicon integrated analytics available now base hardware uh, and this is unique in fact because n4 has been the big uh, you know the big, big release uh, and and everybody that's in the niagara world is going to go through n4 crossover training to get updated to go from ax to n4 if you haven't already done that, you will be uh, at some point in time. But what's really cool about this is the latest version, 1.1, includes an advanced visualization module that uh, it can be broke. It broke new grounds when it was introduced, the Vicon's integrated analytics. But now the innovative product uses real time analytics at edge level, device level, uh, to harness the enormous power of the internet. But what's cool about it is it goes back, it's now available for J600 series and Niagara AX supervisors. It's offered with uh, Niagara Analytics Explorer and Advanced Digital Data Visualization Module. And it supports a wide array of third-party visualization, visualization packages. And it includes an e-learning training option. So in light of the upcoming Niagara Force Summit that's going to be 
happening in May down there in New Orleans. Uh, this is a great post because we have put the direct URL connections for more at Trinity University, uh, the data sheets uh, available for download on control trends, and of course the, uh, the link to uh, the Vicon training uh, site and the Vicon uh, Tritium uh, you know, website is, is available in this post. So it's a great post and uh, it's getting hit pretty good. Very, very cool, Kenny. Very, very cool. Yeah, I can't wait for uh, Vicon or the Trinity meeting in New Orleans. That's going to be something else. So be sure to register for that if you haven't already. And you'll be seeing people like me and Kenny there. All right, what do we have up next, Big Dog? Next up, we have Luis Malgaras. He details Neptronic's new multi-app controller at the 2016 AHR Expo. And uh, Luis is just, uh, he's a gregarious guy. Uh, he's fun. He's, he's a bright guy. I mean, he's very humble. He's actually a certified electrician, a master electrician. He's got, you know, a couple of degrees, one a master's degree, but he actually studied history and he has a profound background. He probably knows American history better than most Americans do because the Canadian history, the Canadians had to keep pace with America, the U.S., for fear that the U.S. would subsume, absorb the parts of Canada that shouldn't, that Canada was very concerned. So they built their railroads in parallel, in conjunction with ours. Our progress was met by their progress, or they met our progress for fear that we'd get to the West Coast first. But that that's another uh, that's another post. Um <laughs> This was uh, a very impressive post because the multi-app controller uh, that uh, Neptronic featured at the HR, we asked him all the things to show us, and he wanted to show that new multi-app controller because it now provides standalone network control for all packaged uh, AC RTUs, rooftop units, heat pumps, fan coil units, and other heating and cooling applications using a configuration setup with a greatly improved menu structure. So the difference there is there's no program required. You can do it right from the stat. And they've improved the menu so that instead of going to parameters, like going through 1 through 74 parameters, you can go right to 74 and tweak that. And then, you know, if you want to go back to 32. So it's a, the menu uh, structure has been greatly improved. Uh, of course, uh, Neptronic has been an innovator for the last 30 years. They came up with the, uh, the patent on the ball valve, actuator ball valve assembly, uh, the capacitance, uh, fail, electronic fail in place. Uh, and now they've got the first industry smart duct heater, which is now networker, networkable via BACnet or Mudbus. It's a game-changing addition to their industry-leading portfolio of ball valves, actuators, and humidifiers. Those guys rock and roll, Kenny. I tell you what, and I, I, I'm with you, Luis and uh, Baggio de Lorenzo. Uh, great guys, great company to work with. Very innovative. They sort of fly under the radar like Kenny uh, in terms of... Uh, but, but I tell you, their products are fantastic, a very competitive price point. So, uh, again, thank you to Luis. And, and they were also sponsors at the 2015 Control Trends Award, so we really appreciate their platinum sponsorship there as well. Be sure to check them out, neptronics.com. All right, Kenny Smyers, what was up next, big dog? Well, Luis start getting into some really good, fun stuff here. This was a highlight reel from the 2015 Control Trends Awards at the Hard Rock Cafe, Orlando, Florida. This was the... First award, the thermostat of the year. So congratulations to Siemens with their RDY 2000, the Ready 2000 thermostat, which was voted best, best commercial thermostat of the year by the global control trends community. And uh, it's a great video, uh, some, some real happy faces in that video. But uh, what a great job they've done to take that uh, that. that well, that, thermostat yeah, three three cool yeah onboard well, humidity uh, sensor right well we'll, uh, we'll talk about the set can you let's back up for a second so a couple of things sure uh, we are we know we, we obviously videoed a lot of collateral video collateral at the control trends awards we've been going through that we're starting to post them now so over the next couple of weeks you'll be seeing tons of stuff we'll have all our award winners we'll have a video up. And uh, the thermostat of the year, again, congratulations to Siemens on that, that RDY 2000. And, you know, Kenny, you got onto that thermostat early on. And, uh, and, you know, we've done several posts on control trends about the stat. It has a lot of visibility, but a lot of flexibility as well. So for our, so, sort of our viewers out there, give them a brief overview of the thermostat and why you think it's, it's such a special stat. Well, number one, uh, and most importantly, uh, it, it has uh, – Universality. The, the problem, I think, you know, especially being a distributor or a contractor, is not having the right part at the right time, or have, not having uh, the right thermostat that can do everything. You know, multi-application. Literally, like we just talked about, Neptronic. That that's extraordinary because you, you reduce your uh, your footprint. You you know, you don't have as many cartons on the shelf. You don't have as many options because you've got one size that basically can handle a lot. And in thermostats and controllers, that's that's a benefit. That's a virtue. But the RDY is a it's a versatile thermostat um, for conventional systems. Three stage heat. Three three-stage cool heat pumps uh, with up to two compressors, two stages of auxiliary heat. 
Uh, it's perfect for commercial equipment too because it has the humidification and dehumidification features on board. It can also uh, you know, tie into your air quality with an optional CO2 sensor so you can maximize the energy efficiencies with your economizer controls and interface with lighting systems based on the business schedule to reduce operating costs. So here's this control in one thermostat and it's very competitively priced and now it's available in BACnet so that you can network it. So again, the, the, the trick in, in, in our world in light, commercials, in the light commercial building space, the race to the small space as you put it, is you got to get fixed right away. You don't have time. So you put the thermostat on the wall, you got the, the equipment under control, you're doing what it's supposed to do auto, automatically, you know, done, walk out the door. But then in the future, as the, the budget provides or as the needs uh, uh, dictate, you can now take that thermostat and immediately back net, uh, connect it to your system. So this gives you now remote, it gives you global scheduling, it gives you all kinds of uh, fascinating uh, you know, operational savings. So you get your energy efficiency, your energy savings right up with the thermostat the installation, and then you get your operational savings as as uh, the te- you know as the needs dictate. So for right. instance, if you have to, well, and, and, your and, and it's an easy set to set up. You don't even have to have a computer to set up. Although you can do it with a computer if you want to. So it's a it's a great uh, piece if you will. again back to the race to the small space for the service contractor or the mechanical contractor. They go in. Thermostat's busted. They need to replace it. Uh, it, it it's, it's a low-cost upgrade that, that allows the owner flexibility going into the future. So, hey, congratulations to Josh Felpern and the team at Siemens. I'm happy to see them get that win there. Right. We'll be on the next big dog. All right. Well, next up, we've got uh, Andy uh, McMillan, the president uh, of BACnet International, and a great uh, post from the C- Control Trends Awards and, and the, the honors that he bestowed against – or to Airbnb for uh, the BACnet uh, Award of the Year, 2015. So Yeah, let's talk about a little that a little bit. So what, what we're doing with the Control Trends Awards is we're reaching out to esteemed organizations like BACnet International. And although the Control Trends Awards will always have uh, the voting component in it, because it is, after all, the People's Choice Award, for lack of a better word, um, and the people get to vote and they get to be heard. But we're also adding things like the Haystack Award, the BACnet International Award, the Cybersecurity Award, where people like BACnet decide who gets that Control Trends Award. So this was the first one. Andy McMillan did a great job, and but it won't be the last. We got a very, very special announcement to make here in just a minute, but we have Ken Sinclair on hold. So we're going to bring Ken Sinclair on for a, a nice chat with Ken, but stay tuned after the interview. Kenny and I have a very important announcement to make. Hey, Ken, tell, Kenny, tell us about our guest today. I'd love to, Eric. Our guest today is the one and only Ken St. Clair from Automated Buildings. Uh, today, we will be talking about Ken's February AB edition, uh, the title being Making It Mashable. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hey, Ken. Thank you, Cold Control Trenders. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ken, I tell, you what, I tell you what, buddy. First of all, uh, thanks for all your help at the Control Trends Awards. I tell you what, you, you, you're such an asset to us, and you did such a great job as usual. You inducted... Uh, uh, Hans Kranz into the Hall of Fame, but you also uh, gave you know, accepted the AHR award on behalf of AHR. So, uh, if you would tell us a little bit about uh, to sort of kick off your impressions of the Control Trends Awards, but also a little bit about AHR, the the impact that they've had on the industry, and a little bit about Hans Kranz. Great. Okay. Actually, uh, let's start with Hans because, uh, gosh, if there's one thing we did that was right, I think that was it was. Uh, to acknowledge uh, Hans, and uh, I love that he became your poster child with that smile on his face, and uh, I was really pleased that I, I wedged the award in his hand before he uh, started his uh, talk, so it, okay. uh, he very much enjoyed that. Uh, I'm hoping that somewhere we can get that, uh, either the moving picture or the still picture of all of those uh, pioneers of BACnet uh, that were on the stage. That was a uh, it was a great moment for me anyway. I, I really enjoyed that. Well, I got to interject real quick because uh, if you caught last week's show, uh, Kenny and I, uh, we were looking at all you guys up on stage and just thinking about what an impact all you guys had had on the industry. And as you know, you, you know, you remind us a little bit of Frank Sinatra anyway, Ken. And, and you know, we were thinking that uh, instead of the Rat Pack with Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra and everybody else, we could have the Backpack or the Backnet Pack. And of course you would have to be Frank Sinatra's role, which is the chairman of the board. I'm not, not sure I'm worthy of that, but uh, 
it was great to uh, acknowledge those pioneers for uh, you know for making uh, making that standard happen uh, that we all use and we, we kind of assume it now and it certainly is a piece of our industry that we all build on uh, but there were there were some interesting uh, early days there for sure <clears throat> and then talking about early days that's a good uh, a good feed into uh, of course uh, the AH heart AH can't even say it, AHR Expo, which of course uh, has been going on for some 86 years, which is just totally amazing that uh, this family has been able to put that show together for Ashray, and uh, it has been the focus of the uh, industry. I'm not sure if you saw the stats that were pretty interesting, came out from Ashray, that uh, yes, indeed, there was over 60,000 folks there totally. And also the thing that uh, caught my interest that there was somewhat over uh, 500 exhibitors from other countries, which is another amazing uh, uh, fact and another amazing growth. Uh, it's interesting in a virtual world that uh, we're all in. Uh, I'm running an online magazine. You're uh, turning this all into amazing videos. Uh, and yet there still is a real requirement for that, for us all to get together and talk face-to-face -face and uh, and let people touch and feel our products and stuff. And AHR has certainly become. I wanted to go back and revisit the people that we had on the stage. In addition to Michael Newman and Hans Kranz and yourself, who are the rest of uh, the Rat Pack or Backpack? I mean, the names, because there's about eight guys you had mentioned. Seven, eight guys, I think. Well, we've had George, George Thomas, uh, Right. Uh, as he's up, uh, one of your Hall of Fame, uh, Hall of Famers from uh, last year, of course, uh, is definitely uh, a strong part of Michael and Hans. Uh, there's also some folks that have pushed the administration and the business side of this from day one, and uh, that would be uh, uh, Raymond Ray from. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, Raymond Ray from Delta Controls, uh, and also uh, uh, Roland Liard from Reliable Controls. Uh, Carl Nelson has been an amazing uh, resource from Delta Controls. He has been the uh, the guy that sort of made all of this work and tested stuff and basically kept the technical side of this thing going since uh, almost the inception. Um, probably missing a whole bunch of other folks, but uh, there's there's probably a core core of about 12 to 15 folks that have actually dedicated their life to Batman, and I find that just totally amazing. And, That's uh, awesome. I, I just wanted to get that uh, the, the name down there, because uh, or the names, because I, I really did feel that it was a big night, special night for uh, Backnet with Andy McMillan's uh, you know, great anecdote, but then at the show, I was with Michael Newman, and some of these people that you just mentioned came up, and it, it was like a fraternity. It was like a, you know, like a, a reunion of a very, very important event, and I think Backnet has uh, proved itself to be probably the most profound, significant protocol in our industry at this time. Uh, there's a, I guess there's a, another little insight there, that, uh, and sometimes you're not that familiar with Ashery, but growing up with Ashery, the pecking order in an Ashery uh, is if you are going to work into a chapter, you have to serve every position. And uh, so you have to start as the, as the running one of the committees and eventually you end up as president. But so it's the involvement uh, is like a 15 year involvement or 10 year involvement. And I think uh, BACnet has taken on the same thing. So you'll actually see uh, the new board of directors has just been uh, announced. So actually, if you take a look at that, it has a pretty good documentation of the folks who have been involved forever in the BACnet movement. Well, very Great cool. Story. Very, very cool, Ken. So uh, impressions of the Control Trends Awards. Look like you had a pretty good time there. I did. I did. It was a very enjoyable uh, uh, venue, except missing my curtain call. I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it took me back in that dark stage and uh, nobody knew where I was. And uh, I couldn't hear you guys. I could see your mouse moving. And uh, I wonder what they're talking about. And, uh, 
<laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's funny, Ken, because, well, you know, we made a list of all the things we need to improve upon next year. And that was one of them. We, we didn't have a monitor back there. So you couldn't hear when you were back there, which was really strange. So we'll get that fixed next year. As a matter of fact, uh, Kenny's already booked a Hard Rock Live for Sunday night in Las Vegas. So we've got the venue for next year's show. So we're good to go there. And uh, sure hoping we can we, we can have you and, and the rest of the uh, back net pack there again. Great. No, that sounds sounds good. January 29th, 6.30 to 9.30. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, listen, Ken, uh, let's move on to the automated building, the, the February issue of uh, automatedbuildings.com, which is live now. Uh, I've been going through it, and for our viewers out there, uh, Kenny and I get a tremendous amount of information from automatedbuildings.com, and you should too. It's a great publication. Ken usually has a theme every month, and this month's theme is Make It Mashable. So, Ken, could you sort of give us an update on what do you mean by mashable, and why is that important in our industry today? I think the mashable concept is is a giant one for our industry because – all of us have been in it long enough that we know that we used to uh, we used to kind of take everything and try and do it ourselves and uh, and basically throw bad stuff at the other our competitors and uh, the whole industry has completely changed around to that we're a, a moving collaboration and we now have to push ourselves together and we have to create value. Because if we don't create value, IFT will just, you know, basically absorb us. So I think we're understanding better, and uh, certainly out on the exhibit floor, that everybody is is trying harder to meet uh, to make a, a, a mashable piece, a piece of the industry that can become part of uh, a bigger whole. And uh, when I laid out that title, I, that was before I went to. AHR and I thought, wow, this is kind of airy fairy stuff, and the industry is going to burn me on it. Actually, when I got and started talking to the thought leaders uh, at uh, in Orlando, uh, everybody was on the same page. They're saying, "Yeah, uh, we get it. We, we know we have to make stuff uh, matchable." We've had a really good uh, response anywhere I posted on social media. A bunch of people have, you know, said, "Yeah, right on. That's good." A good post, uh, I like what you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a good thing for us. Uh, we've had good, uh, Ken, 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 Eric here, I want, I want to hop in real quick because, you know, another topic you talked about in the past was, and, and I always get this word wrong, Kenny always has to correct me, but uh, co-competition or what's co, the word? Co-opetition. Co co-opetition, where competitors sort of get together and cooperate. Uh, seems like, is that a piece of something being mashable or th- are those two related? I think they are. Uh, I think uh, the Mashable, of course, comes from the IIT world, and uh, it's the other thing is is uh, if you have a chance to read uh, Toby's column uh, this this month. It's uh, let me just make sure I quote it right. Build to Mash, and basically what he's saying is IIT is basically build build to mash. I mean, that's, that's basically the way the whole IFT is coming together. No one person is building the internet of things. It's a whole bunch of myriad of people. Millions of people are building their little piece. And then we smash all these little pieces together to do these incredible things. That's the architecture of IFT. Uh, very, very cool. Well, one of my teachers, I quote quite often, Marshall Thurber, uh, I studied innovation with him at one point in time, and, and this goes probably back 10, 15 years, and, and he was using the term mashable, and basically that was at the heart of innovation, when you can take disparate pe- things and put them together, mash them up to create something new, and uh, you know he, he had indicated the Japanese were known for that for years, where it's sort of instead of just inventing one thing, you look at what's out there and you, you mash it together to create a different competition, a uh, different uh, offering if you will so this is really cool that this is coming back around to our industry and and so now sort of drill it down to sort of your readers and our audience which are systems integrators uh, manufacturers users so what's sort of the takeaway i mean obviously for the manufacturers if you're building something i mean it's pretty clear that you want 
what you're building to be mashable. But how does that affect the rest of us, Ken, in terms of like a, an integrator or a user? Um, how, how, how do you, you know, what's the takeaway from them regarding mashability? Well, I think the takeaway is, is to get their heads further into what IoT services are available that are mashable that they can use and also what are other folks in the industry doing. Uh, if somebody's doing something really well, if somebody's got a good cybersecurity piece or somebody's got a good uh, data analytics piece or a uh, cloud service and it works fine, maybe you should just mash that into your offering rather than attempting to try and do it yourself. Uh, the problem with trying to do any of this yourself is you run the risk of never getting to the end before somebody creates something greater that pulls us in a different direction. So I think when you're doing your projects, you basically have to mash up with the best uh, stuff you have available uh, at the moment. And uh, probably that's something that uh, is high on both uh, you and Kenny's agenda is trying to keep the leading edge mashable bits. Uh, and I know you, you basically your whole business is built on that is basically coming up with the right product, the right time for the right price. And uh, so we have to be a lot more flexible in, in what it is we're going to put. Uh, bottom line is in all of these things, you go to IBCon, uh, the actual building owners, they don't care whether we use BACnet or paper clips or uh, Close pins to put this stuff together. They just want it to work and they want it on their screens and stuff. So they, you have to figure out the easiest and the fastest way of doing that. Shaking Ken, our head. Ken, to your point, uh, we had an uh, article by um, DigiLogic, uh, Eugene Mazo. He was evangelizing open source at one of the large uh, health um, meetings out there in California, University of California, San, F San Francisco had a big uh, symposium. And that was what he was saying. He says that we need to evangelize open source. I think this all just really lays really close into what you're saying about mashability. You know, we saw the eruption uh, kind of or the emergence of Project Haystack. We saw, uh, you know, open source uh, and, and the fact that you've hit on that iteration. In other words, one of the big concepts of this book, Bold, which is, is a very great read, is that you fail, not necessarily fail, but you make your effort. You take things as far as you can and let somebody else pick up that momentum and somebody else picks up the momentum. And pretty soon you've got this big, incredible project done where if anybody tries to do it by themselves, like you said, they don't get the closure. They can't bring it to market and they've made it uh, kind of proprietary. So I think this mashability was a great read for uh, anybody in our business because we have to become, like you said, become mashable or be absorbed. Great. Yeah. The other, the other thing that you just triggered on there too is that the mashability, uh, it crosses, it's not just between building automation and IFT. It's also now what we need to do is we need to mash into the healthcare system. We need to mash into the hotel system. It has to be part of the, the uh, mashing that's going on. Hotel systems are a great example that there's definitely a move towards uh, opening the door with your cell phone. And uh, they know when you're in the hotel, they know where you are in the hotel because of that. And uh, so that information is available for our automation. We can start and stop stuff. We can, uh, then the cleaning staff gets involved because they know when it's best to clean the room without annoying the occupant. So this, that's all mashable. That's just all these little bits and pieces. And so when we go in, to sell our wares, we need to be uh, understand that we are part of a, an integration team and uh, no longer well not integrated. We are one of the integrators and our expertise is in the building audience. Well, Ken, I wanted, wanted to follow up on something you said. You said that the, the owners, and I think this is true the way it is today, the owners really don't care as long as it works. And what what I'm getting at, and here's my question for you, is, is 
should the owners care? And what I mean by that is if you look at how business is done now, I mean, it's basically the manufacturers are trying to get some sort of an edge to get in, to lock other people out. And the only way that's going to change, in my opinion, is if the owners are educated and are saying, no, we don't care what the system is as long as it's mashable, open, uh, and, and has these characteristics. But, but to me, without the owners understanding that and pushing that back through the engineers and through the integrators and the contractors, I'm not sure that the manufacturers are going to shift uh, because, again, if, if, if nobody's buying the Kool-Aid, you can have the best Kool-Aid in the world, and it's just going to sit there. Yeah, I think the, the, other, the other side of Mashable, I think, is, is coming from our home markets and uh, all the things we mash together uh, on our cell phones and uh, the apps that we all have that are completely different. If you look at each other's cell phone are completely different. The things you're using, the things I'm using, the apps. Uh, so what's happening is I don't think we have so much of a situation that that the owner is, he's looking for those mashable solutions. He's looking for how can I make this look like the apps on my phone? How can I, how can I get my building operating uh, the best way? So as long anything that is sort of proprietary, I think, is almost on the other side of the equation now. Is is uh, the owner is going to say, "Well, just a minute, I can only access this from uh, you know a special terminal, or I have to put in a virtual private network to make this secure." Uh, that's another big problem: is is having all of this openness and somehow keeping it secure. So. Yeah, there's a bunch of conflicting things. It's it's a case, and we, we need to we need to educate uh, the owner. But if you go to events like IvyCon, which is my event or my intention to go to in uh, San Jose this year in June, uh, you get to see these sophisticated owners, and I think they're almost on the other side of the equation. Uh, they're starting to uh, they're, they're starting to drive us. Maybe an example of that is the fact that uh, you know ESI was bought out by global facility folks, and I think that's significant because it, and again, I think what that shows is that the integrator is an important piece of the big process. And as an integrator, you better figure out how you're going to have that clout and that position that some large uh, real estate folks are going to see you as important enough to make you a giant member of their team. Well, Ken, I think that uh, that example with C.B. Richard Ellis buying ESI is just the tip of the iceberg. But we kind of saw that coming. We uh, we had been at the Realcom Ibicons and saw how the – MSIs are being positioned and qualified and vetted, and then all of a sudden spring hits and, and the ESI is now part of maybe Richard Ellis. I think what these gigantic real estate service companies have to have is that expertise, and they don't have the time to home grow it. They used to use consultants, and they used to use the uh, rely on the, the specification system that basically doesn't work. Uh, you know, in, in their at their capacity, they're just you know. Uh, global uh, environments and distributed environments, they can't wait, wait for system specifications to align and become you know, open. So I think we're going to see more and more where these gigantic players and middle-sized uh, players are going to take the existing talents out there of our integrators and basically come, you know, absorb them, buy them, and that'll become a, a departmental strength instead of a weakness. I think that's very much the trend. I think, uh, I think a, a lot of the Larger integrators probably are at risk. That's probably not the right word. But basically, have their retirement plan uh, <laughs> set out for them that they will right. be absorbed by larger uh, operating companies. And and I think the pattern's somewhat set there too. The the fact that uh, uh, CBRE bought uh, Johnson Controls, the operating division uh, of it, uh, was another. This, uh, virtually the same week as they bought ESI, so that was that was another sort of clear cannon shot across our bow. So, so what does what does the integrators we deal with on a daily basis? What do they need to do? They've got to 
start honing their skills at putting together all of this mashable stuff and showing that what they're good at is expertise. And what they're selling is exactly what Paul Oswald always says. The only thing we have is our people. Our people are our assets. It's not the products. And the fact that you guys have your companies that have gone on forever, uh, you know, selling control equipment, it has not been the control equipment. It hasn't been that magic controller that you sold and made a million dollars on. It's basically been your ability to read the trends of the future and basically bring in the new products that are, in fact, the ones that the integrators need. The integrators need to know what are the new products that they can move ahead with, and we also need to uh, just just keep keep this whole growth going. Hey, Ken, listen, another big part of our community uh, are consulting engineers. And when you, you've been around for a long time like we have, and they've, they have played over the years an integral part in, uh, in the products that get selected and what goes in and the quality in the buildings. And we've got a few that really have adopted the new technology, very enlightened. And I can see where those guys are going to survive, but we see so many that, that haven't. They're still using the same old proprietary spec from the local branch. They're not willing to change. Uh, you know, it's not broke. Don't fix it. But uh, what role do you see them playing in as a consulting engineer? I mean, with all these people buying these big enlightened real estate companies buying technology like they did with ESI, I mean, are, are they threatened? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I always draw on my uh, experience of uh, sort of flipping over five decades of watching building automation evolve. And this doesn't really look an awful lot different than the BBC revolution in the 80s where we had the old consultants that would not let go of their pneumatics. And uh, up, up here in BC, we took a, an unusual uh, approach to that. We actually did rip the controls away from them and uh, put it in a request for proposal. We bought it the way we would buy computer systems because that's what it most looks like. And I think in larger projects, that's not a bad solution. Uh, let the traditional engineers do what they traditionally have done. Uh, specified children, boilers, uh, air handling units, but the whole optimization piece and the controls could in fact be removed and handled uh, in a uh, another approach. And I think that's something you might start seeing uh, in the, the super operators and the enlightened real estate people, understanding how important the integration piece is. Uh, the logical solution is to remove it from the the, bricks, the brick and mortar, and of course the brick and mortar in our industry uh, looks like a gigantic chiller, a boiler, and a, and a bunch of pumps. Uh, those are our bricks and mortars that we build our buildings with. But it's really, really important how we control those, how we interact that with the grid. And we probably can't affect, expect the people who are good at, uh, at coming up with a, a piece of equipment. To, Ken, that was uh, a very profound summary. I, I think uh, we're going to quote you on that where you said, that uh, let the traditional engineers, you know, keep keep charge of the chillers, boilers, and the equipment. But really, truly, the optimization of building integration of smart buildings has to take another approach. I think that that really kind of summarized where we're at right now, and that's what we need. We need that other approach. We need to be in that other approach. I think our evolution, our survivability and sustainability is that other approach. The other thing too, with all of this technology, is it's uh, it came out in the uh, the collaboratory. Uh, and Andy is Andy McMillan is such an elegant speaker, and uh, and he just talked about that, and he used the example of what it was like. And uh, Eric's got to understand this more than anybody is what it was like uh, five years ago to put a video online, and how easy it is now. It's just day and night. And so, if we follow this leading edge technology, the whole it's it's almost to the point that it's. It maybe makes more sense to, to build these buildings, let them let them do whatever it is they do to get them going, and then we just come in and, and retrofit them. The, the first six months commissioning will come in, and we'll actually troll the systems and troll the web services and mash them into the enterprise. It's 
Well, hey, Ken, listen, I, I think you're right on it with that, but but you you tweak something for me and, and on behalf of Kenny and myself and Samir Prada, our man in India that uh, is our director over there, we were blown away by your collaboratory. And, and uh, I'd like to take a few minutes as we wind the interview down and, and really sort of hone in on that. Uh, you know, we've written about it. You've, you know, you've written about it, but you guys started it. First of all, great job. I can't think of anybody that does a better job at that than you or could do a better job than you, but man, that was awesome. So speak a bit if you would about, uh, the collaboratory this year. Well, uh, it's always easy to do something like that when you have a string of talent, right? Like I had, uh, we're very lucky to have those folks, uh, and, what happened this year that was even better than the years before is they all really started to collaborate and feed off of each other, uh, even to the point that they said, look, what we need is a, a lighting person in here as well, because this is a, a, another big piece of our industry that, uh, that we, need to, we need to kind of push ahead. I'm still confused. Uh, it's, those that know me know that I do all kinds of things without thinking. And uh, the collaboratory was probably one of those things. And it's something that needs to be done, but I'm not sure who it's for or why. Uh, but it's it's kind of fun. And we kind of go into the room and we get to uh, talk about stuff. Uh, we're having a little trouble selling it. And uh, in some ways, I'm kind of wondering if that's a bad thing or a good thing. Uh, the good side of it is is that we we can kind of keep the conversation focused. Uh, if we get too large of a, an audience, it could it could take us away, and we could be talking about some esoteric thing that uh, may not be all that valuable to moving the industry ahead. So it is kind of neat. I love the fact that you guys are part of the collaboratory. And you bring this to uh, to the folks after, uh, and it's sort of something we can all look at and zone in, even on pieces of it, and uh, pull out uh, just what one individual said, or we can look at it in in the uh, spirit it was uh, presented. So anyway, uh, no, I do not. It's great, you know, great stuff, Ken. And, and, and I think part of it is uh, this is probably not your first time that you've you've been out front and, and it takes the rest of us a little bit of time to catch up. I mean, that's one of the thing that, things that Kenny and I love about you is you, you seem like you're always two steps into the future. And uh, I say that the collaboratory is going to get wings. And I say your next big problem is you're going to have too many people trying to get into the room. And that'll be a different problem we'll deal with. But I would encourage our community. uh, There are links both on Ken's site and on Control Trends where you can see the video of this and benefit from it. Not just this year's, but last year's. And uh, Ken, again, you know, just marvelous job. And please keep that up. As a matter of fact, Samir Prada, our director in India, is looking forward to having you come to India uh, and in the next couple of years and do a collaboratory over there with uh, some of the Indian thought leaders. <laughs> yeah, can I think it uh, might just a summary of that, that the most recent one, it's like a seminar that, you know, you can normally charge money for because it's, it's probably got, you know, the, the faculty or the founders or the board or whatever you want to call them have the most recent experiences in our industry and their own expertises. And they're all there primed and ready to talk about things and answer them. So if, if I was somebody that was concerned about something or trying to look at a crystal ball, I mean, there's no greater you know assembly of crystal ballers, you know, people that actually know what's coming next because they're the ones that are driving the change. It's a great opportunity to really catch up. I'm surprised manufacturers don't say, hey, we need a representative. Each one of you guys, uh, you know, each one of the major manufacturing vendors should be, a, you know, listen to what's going on because that's probably the most current thought, uh, you know, that's directing the changes in our industry or at least tracking them. Actually, it's interesting because that actually came up in the collaboratory. I think uh, Roland Lear asked that question, what, what do you guys see? From your crystal ball in the future, and it got answered by John Petsy, is saying that we got so much amazing technology already that the people can't figure out what the heck we're doing. <laughs> and, right. Uh, that is that is a bigger problem. So uh, I think that falls back on uh, on automated buildings and control trends to keep on keeping on and, and try and keep up with the education and try and uh, try and close that gap of what's 
what's being invented and what's uh, out there now so we can get it out to the systems integrators who can uh, help sell it to the owners and to the sophisticated owners at uh, venues such as IBM. Very well said. Our guest is Ken Sinclair, AutomatedBuildings.com. The February issue is now out, so be sure to check it out. Hey, Ken, man, thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us. We'll catch up with you when the March issue hits the street. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the support. And actually, thanks for all those kind words. Wow, those are amazing. Hey, man, you you are, after all, the chairman of the board. All right, Kenny, the big, big news of the week. Tell them about what's going on. All right, Eric. Well, uh, we've got a couple of things, but the first was the release of Control Trans India. Uh, we were uh, very fortunate to meet uh, Samir Pratin, who's the director of Control Trans India. He is one of the most uh, accomplished and, and hardworking guys I've ever met. And we came up with it. We proposed a theme. He actually approached us, and we developed a theme, and now we actually have it implemented. So everybody try www.controltrans.in, as in India, and you will see – uh, one of the most uh, immediate starts that we've ever had, a successful start uh, for Control Trends now, taking a global uh, you know, footprint, that dimension, and, and, and actually have now a tangible site that's growing. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the Indian markets, it's, it's the emerging market in the world. Uh, they've set aside billions and billions of dollars to make 100 smart cities happen. And these are the catalysts in India now that are actually you know making that happen. So We've been very uh, fortunate to be able to be the interlocutors to take the markets, people, vendors, solution providers, you know, product providers, and introduce them to people in the emerging market area through Samir Pratt and through Control Trends India now. And we're seeing a lot happen. We're already seeing uh, incredible exchanges going through the pipeline and uh, more to come. But uh, we will continue to uh, introduce uh, more of Samir. So, uh, they have a big, big... Uh, uh, show going on in India that uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But what, what's your thoughts about what, what's well, happening? First of all, first? Um, you know, Samir, you know, I think one of the things that makes maybe control trends a little bit unique is the fact that, you know, Kenny and I are both working, you know, every day in the business. So uh, this is sort of our, our nighttime job, if you will. But but so we have a perspective of uh, uh, of what's really going on. We have the ear of the customers because we're in the trenches every day. And Samir Pradhan is like that as well. He owns a company. He's a systems integrator in India. So he has that perspective of uh, being in the trenches every day. And he has taken on becoming the director of Control Trends India, uh, you know, is, is a second vocation as well. And, and I think part of his charter there, what we've heard from Samir is that that uh, the Indian market uh, has not had the benefit, if you will, of, uh, of all the products and the things that are going on in the U.S. Most of their stuff has come through Europe. And, uh, you know, you got three or four people, according to Samir, that are sort of controlling that message. And when he came and covered the AHR show, Kenny, he was just totally blown away by the products and the services that are available here. So one of the trends that he is seeing, and we'll call it right here on Control Trends, is the migration of the U.S., primarily maybe your independence to India, because most of the bigs already have a presence in India, but it's coming through their European type offices. So correct or incorrect, uh, the one thing we do know for sure is there's a $400 billion set aside, that's B with a, a billion with a B for smart cities. So India is really ramping up and guys like Samir and the systems integrators over there are looking for better, more cost-effective solutions uh, to bring to their customers. So among other things, Samir will be covering the Indian market. So he'll probably be, be interviewing Indian owners, Indian consulting engineers, Indian integrators, and looking at, you know, India, Indian type projects. So we sort of see control trends. India as being a window into that Indian market for our U S uh, and European customers and uh, a window out, if you will, for our friends in India to see what's available in the rest of the world. So we're very, very excited. We think we've got the right guy to be the director over there, Samir Pradham. So Samir, thank you so much. We'll be bringing him on the show in the very near future so you can meet him personally. Eric, I, I just wanted to reemphasize that uh, you are saying about being involved daily in the business. Uh, we didn't mention yet, but Samir is the CEO and managing director of CICC, Automated Technologies. And the show that's coming up, it's uh, a global in scope, is ACREX, A-C-R-E-X, India, 2016. It's 25 through 27 February 2016, and it's in Mumbai, India. 
exciting time. It's a very exciting time, Kenny Smyers. Okay, buddy. Well, we're up against it time-wise. Anything else before we hop off? No, that was it, Eric. Okay. I think we got it all done. Well, with that, Kenny, I'll say a very special thanks to our, our guests, John and Igor from Echo Rhythm and Ken Sinclair from AutomatedBuildings.com. And again, uh, a special shout out to our partner in India, the director over there, Samir Pradham. And with that, Kenny, I'll wish everybody a happy Super Bowl Sunday. And remember, stay... What's your prediction? What's your prediction? But dude, you're messing my rhythm up here. I, I, I'm on a rhythm here. Let, let, okay, so I got to do this again. All right, hang on. Sorry. Well, you were good. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What's your prediction? Carolina wins uh, 31, 31-17. I, they don't I, blow them up. Yeah, so they, they cover the spread. That means the bookies win because if it's four points, they cover the spread. What, the only people that went with that bookies. I could go with that. All right. So, with that, sorry. <laughs> a you special thanks to our right? guests John and Igor from Echo Rhythm, Ken Sinclair from AutomatedBuildings.com. And we appreciate you tuning in. And with that, remember, stay in control. Indeed, Eric. Indeed. Kenny Smiles. <laughs> yeah, sorry, bro.